that's one big difference between knitting a sweater that you never wear and ends up in the back of your closet or a sweater that you wear all the time and always gets tons of compliments. Your yarn choice. You're scrolling through social media and you find a perfect sweater pattern that you just can't wait to cast on. So you run to your stash and you look through it and you find a sweater's quantity of yarn that's the absolute perfect color and it's the same gauge as the yarn that's used in the pattern. You happily knit the sweater. Maybe you stop and try it on a few times and everything looks like it's going perfectly well. You finally finish and you cast off. You try it on again and it looks great. And then you wash it and it continues to grow or it biases off to the side, or the neckline gets really droopy. What was the big mistake here? You didn't swatch and test that yarn to make sure it would be the right fit for that sweater pattern. And in the end, that sweater ends up in a pile of other sweaters that you just never wear because something isn't quite right about it. Hey Nerdy Knitter, Tanya here. I'm a certified knitting instructor and a master hand knitter, and I believe that knitting is a form of self-care, that you can take time for yourself and your creative hobbies and still create beautiful garments for yourself or your loved ones that you'll always love to wear. And in our little story in the introduction, that's what our knitter wants. She wants a sweater that she is going to just fall in love with. You could probably point out a few things that she did wrong when she chose her yarn. We're going to talk about four things that you need to look at when you're choosing a yarn for your next knitting project. Um, unless you're gonna just use the yarn that's recommended in the pattern and you'll definitely get an outcome that will match the pictures that are in the sample for the pattern. But if you're like most knitters, you probably use a different yarn. And there are things you need to consider when choosing a yarn. Not all yarns are suitable for all knitting projects and you have to take these things into consideration. We're gonna go through all four things. I also have a printable that you can download. You'll find a link down below when you join my emailing email list, then you can get a link for that and you can download it and you can print it and use it the next time you're going to knit and you wanna substitute a yarn. It walks through each of these four steps and gives you a little place to write out your possible substitutions and what you can look at with each of those yarns to decide which one would be the best choice for your project. And we're also going to have what I call a little yarn sub play. I asked about the yarns you would like to substitute and I'm going to show you how I would substitute them. So we had a lot of comments. I picked a few. I can't answer all of them or we would be here all day, but I'm going to show you how I would do it. And you can apply this to any pattern or any yarn and follow the steps to choosing an appropriate substitute for that yarn. Hey knitters, editing Tanya here. I have to pop in and share something with you before you watch the rest of this video. You're going to hear a little background noise occasionally, and that is because there is no cricket in your house. Your appliances are not chirping at you. It's because my fire alarm decided it needed to start chirping at me because I need to replace the batteries. And I thought that you couldn't hear it, that my microphone wouldn't pick that noise up. But as I'm editing, I realized that I was completely wrong, that you can hear that noise, but it's not a cricket in your house. Your appliances are not beeping at you. It's my fire alarm. So I have replaced the batteries now, so we're good to go. But there's your PSA to check the batteries in your fire alarm. And if you want to turn this into a little game, why not get some chocolate? And every time you hear that little chirp, eat a piece. Let's get back to our video. Now mistake number one is the yarn weight and gauge. Our little story at the beginning, she got this one right. She chose a beautiful color, but she did mention that her yarn was the right gauge and matched the gauge in the pattern. So that first step, that's what we need to do when we are choosing a substitute yarn. You can't obviously see a pattern that's knit with a sock weight yarn and decide you're going to knit it with an Aran weight yarn. Those are two very different yarn weights. So I'm not talking about like the literal weight of the skein or the ball of yarn. We're talking about the thickness of the yarn itself, the thickness of that strand. And that's divided into different categories. I'm going to use the Craft Yarn Council's chart as our base here because that's pretty standard here in North America. So your yarn label, they might have the symbol for that yarn weight, a bulky weight, a medium weight, a super fine weight. They might have that little number that's on the little ball band. Or if it doesn't, it should have gauge information at least. And we can use that to figure out which grouping or weight grouping that that yarn falls within. If we talk about like a medium, number four, Craft Yarn Council, that's like a worsted weight. And the gauge information is probably between 16 and 20 stitches in four inches. So other yarns would fall somewhere within that 
that range between 16 and 20 stitches in four inches to be considered a medium four or a worsted weight if you're going to go by the names like that. But you, that's the first thing you want to look at is that ball band information. You're looking for the gauge information or if it says worsted or it has the little symbol for Craft Yarn Council, you want to know that you want to know which section, which weight grouping that yarn falls into and you want to choose one that's within the same weight grouping. Now it might not have exactly the same gauge information. One yarn could have a very specific number of stitches to the inch and another yarn could have a range of stitches to that inch or four inches. You're just looking for a ballpark to tell you which weight that yarn's going to fall into. That's your first step. Now the next thing to look at is the fiber content of the yarn itself. You want to start by looking at the pattern and looking at the fiber content in the yarn that was used in the sample. And this will give you an idea of what kind of properties that you need for that specific garment. So look at the garment as well. Is it a summer top that's really light and airy and drapey? You're probably not going to want like a really thick acrylic for something like that. Or is it a winter sweater with lots of cables? You're not going to want cotton yarn for that. So you can get an idea by looking at the garment itself and looking at the fiber content in the yarn to decide which fibers would be appropriate for that garment. So look at that project and note down any like sort of characteristics that you think are important. Does it need to be nice and drapey and flowy? Does it need to have structure and hold its shape? Does it have lots of texture? These are things you want to note in the pattern because your fiber choice can affect how those things will end up looking. There are four different fiber types that we're going to look at. Now I'm going to just go through these fairly quickly. If you want to dive into any of them in more detail, you'll find links to my website. I've got articles on all these different fibers and you can read them at your leisure. But we're just going to do sort of a high level overview. So the four categories are the first one is protein fibers or animal fibers. So think of your wools, your alpaca, your camel, your llama, your cashmere, mohair, your silk, all of those fibers that come from animals. Then there are cellulose fibers or plant fibers like your linens and your cottons. They come from plants. Then we have synthetic fibers. These are obviously man-made fibers from like different petrochemical processes. I don't know how it works, but think your acrylics and your nylons. Then we have a fourth category. This is the biosynthetics. So these are cellulose fibers but they need some sort of synthetic process to break them down. Like cotton, you could go to a field of cotton, pick some and spin it and start knitting with it. Could not do that with bamboo. You can't just chop down some bamboo and start knitting with it. It has to be broken down so that um, material can be turned into a fiber. So I still sort of group these with the other cellulose fibers because in the end they act the same. They just require a more synthetic process to get them to that point. So those are our groupings of fibers. Now our protein fibers, not silk though, we're going to leave that one. That one's almost in a category by itself because it's not quite the same as other animal fibers. If you think of animal fibers like the fleece on um, a sheep and stuff like that, it's basically hair and hair has scales, it has a cortex and the silk doesn't have those things. So it's a little bit different. Uh, and I think it's it's almost a little bit closer to some of our plant fibers. It's very smooth and silky and drapey like a lot of the plant fibers. We think of our other animal fibers though, think of it like hair. They've got scales, they're lightweight, they've got this cortex inside that holds all this warm air. So in general, your animal fibers, these protein fibers, are lightweight, they are warm, they, some of them are elastic, some of them are not. Alpaca has no elasticity. It's beautiful and drapey, but it's not going to hold its shape. When I talk about elasticity, I mean the ability to stretch, but then to like hold its shape and its structure. Alpaca can't do that. It's a very soft and more smooth fiber. On the other hand, wool is right at the top. That one is the one you want when you want a lot of elasticity and stretch, and you want that garment to have some memory and to hold its shape. And they're all very warm and light too. But the cons are that they can felt. And of course, sometimes you want projects that you can felt, but in general, when you're knitting, you don't want that. So you have to be very careful with taking care of them and hand washing carefully so those fibers don't stick together into one mass and felt your project. 
And of course, there's going to be different levels of softness depending on the animal. We've got very soft cashmere up to a very scratchy woolly wool that you wouldn't use next to your skin, but would make a wonderful like outer garment that would keep you very, very warm. Now, super watch wool is in a category by itself when we talk about properties because it's very different. It's not going to act like untreated wool. Super wash wool has been treated, and there's a couple different ways it can be treated. The, the scales are basically, they can be either burned off completely off the fibers, so they won't stick together, so it won't felt, or they can be like coated, so the sort of like a glue or something applied to the fibers so it coats those scales so they won't stick together. The problem is we don't know which process is used with which yarn. If it says superwash, you don't know which process was used. The the one where the fiber the scales are actually burnt off, that's never going to felt. Those scales are gone and that is what felting that's what happens when it felts. Those scales start sticking together more and more and more until you've got a felted mess and not your you can't see your knitted stitches anymore. On the other hand, the other type of superwash, after continued washings and dryings, that coating can wear off in your project, can felt. So I still think you need to treat your superwash gently. I don't dry mine. I might occasionally, just to maybe shrink it back up again. But when I am swatching for a sweater, I am very careful with how I'm going to use a superwash yarn. I might knit it more tightly to make sure it's going to hold its shape, since those scales aren't there to help the wool hold its shape. And I'm going to really take good measurements when I'm blocking my swatch. And I'm going to wash and block the swatch the same way I'm going to do with my sweater. If I'm not going to put my sweater in the dryer, I don't want to do that with the swatch. So I want to know if that yarn is going to grow, which seems to be a big problem with a lot of people. They knit a sweater with superwash yarn, they wash it, and then all of a sudden it's a tunic because it just kept growing. You can find this stuff out before you knit your sweater by knitting a swatch and treating it like you're going to treat your finished sweater. And I still don't think you should wash and dry it like you would your other clothes because that superwash coating can still come off at some point and your project could have felt and the properties of that sweater would be completely different. But on the other hand, superwash wool has a lovely drape because those scales aren't there to help the fiber stick together. They sort of slide past each other and it creates a really drapey, beautiful fabric, which is nice when you want it. Then we have our cellulose fibers or biosynthetics. We're going to put them both together, plant fibers basically. Now these fibers have some good qualities and some bad qualities. They are overall fairly durable, they're breathable, they have nice drape. Unlike the animal fibers, they don't have scales so they don't stick together. But on the downside, they're not as elastic as wool and they can be heavier. So if you're planning to knit like a seamless sweater that has no seams at the shoulders or sleeves for structure, a plant fiber might not be the best choice because it's heavier in general compared to wool and it is not as elastic so it's not going to hold its shape like a wool would. Then we have a synthetics and in general, well an acrylic especially is made to mimic wool. So its properties are very similar to wool in some regards, not all. So I mean it's inexpensive, it is durable, it's lightweight, it has some elasticity to it, but it's not very breathable, it can make you feel clammy. It's not as warm as wool, it's also heat sensitive, it can melt under specific situations with heat. It's also water resistant, so it's harder to remove stains and odors. Now you can choose whatever fibers you want for your garment and it might work, it might not, but this is where you want to take those fiber properties and the garment properties in mind, like that elastic feel, you want that with your nicely textured cable sweaters, or if you have a shawl, you want lots of lovely drape, you want to choose something that's going to give you some drape. So you want to combine what you need from the garment and from the fiber properties from the wool or the, the choice of yarn itself. The third mistake is not thinking about the construction of the yarn itself, how it's spun and how it's plied. Now you don't often find out which way a yarn is spun, but you can look at it to tell how many plies it has or if it's tightly plied or loosely plied, you can see some of this information just by looking at a strand of yarn by itself. But the first thing to think about is whether it's woolen spun or worsted spun. Some yarns aren't going to tell you, a lot of them might tell you which method is used. So a woolen spun, in the process of spinning the fiber into that single ply, um, it there, the fiber it can be like this, just it's a mass of fiber. They've got to wash it and take care of it and one of the things they can do is card it. And when they card it, it becomes sort of this, 
woolly mass. All the fibers are all over the place and they're not all like uniform and laying flat. It's just a big woolly mass. And then when it's in that state is when they use their spinning wheel or whatever they're using to spin even a drop spindle. They're pulling those fibers out while it's still in this big woolly mass and spinning it into that single ply. And it gives you a very nice light weight, holds lots of air because you have all of these fibers moving all over the place. They're not uniform. So there's lots of places for air to get trapped and keep you really warm when you knit it up into a sweater. And it's also very lightweight because all those fibers are all over the place. There's lots of room for air to get in there. So it's pretty lightweight, very warm. Then there is worsted spun, and this one begins with carding. In carding, what they're doing is taking all those fibers and putting them, combing them out so they're all in the same direction. It's not called combing, it's called carding. But what they're doing is using their carders to get all of these fibers to lay flat and nice together and not this big woolly mess. And then when they're all nice and flat and smooth like that, then they spin them into that single ply. And this is different from the woolen yarn in that it is much smoother and it's much tighter and it's much denser. So it doesn't hold as much air as the woolen spun and it's also denser. So it's going to weigh more than the woolen spun. Then once these fibers have been put into these singles, then they can be plied together or they might not be. You could have like a woolen spun just single that you could knit with. It might be, it might break very easily, but it's going to make a nice light, lightweight, very warm garment. Or it could be plied perhaps in like a two ply or the, the singles could be plied into three plies or even more plies than that or plied and then plied again with other plies. Like there's lots of different ways to create the yarn and the plies affect how the yarn acts as well. So your single is going to be that nice warm fluffy, most likely a woolen spun. But I mean, the worst it's spun, you could use, I think there must be singles of that as well, but they would be denser and smoother than a woolen spun. Then your two plies, they are kind of flat. And you'll see a lot of two plies for like stranded color work knitting. And what happens there is you want those fibers sort of to stick together and have like a cohesive color where all of the, you don't see like each individual stitch in your stranded color work. It's all sort of a fuzzy picture where all of the stitches sort of blend together. That two ply helps with that. Two ply is also good for lace. And then we have three ply or more plies. That's when the yarns start to get rounder and they will have better stitch definition, depending on how tightly they're twisted as well. That can affect the stitch definition and also the durability. So uh, think of a loosely spun, loosely plied, gonna be less durable, more likely to pill, highly spun, lots of plies. There's less friction and movement because it, the, the yarn is tighter, so it's less likely to pill, it's more durable. One's not better than the other. It just depends on the circumstance that you're knitting. You, in your stranded color work sweater, you want sort of, it's going to, it might pill a little, or probably will, but you want that sort of soft, fuzzy halo from that lightly spun or two-ply yarn. When you're knitting like a cabled sweater and you really want all the texture to stand out, you probably want to choose a tightly twisted plied yarn. You want it to be more durable and elastic and really show those stitches. So those are some things to consider with construction that can affect the durability of the garment, how tightly or loosely spun and plied it is. It can also affect the elasticity of the garment too. And, um, and also the density or the weight of the garment. When you've got a light two-ply woolen spun yarn, it's going to be very light and airy. Where you've got a tightly spun and tightly plied yarn, it's going to be more dense and going to weigh more. And then we have another special category of fiber construction here, and that's a chainette yarn or corded or cable plied yarn. Now these yarns are a little bit different. If you look at a chainette yarn, if you find one online and you look closely at the picture, it almost looks like a little eye cord. This is really great for yarns that don't have elasticity or a lot of structure on, on its own, like our plant fibers. When they are spun into this chainette, that makes them more lightweight. Remember, they're pretty heavy compared to our wool and animal fibers. And it gives it some elasticity because that little cord is 
pretty elastic compared to like the fiber itself. So a chainette construction is really great and is a good option if you want to use that plant fiber yarn in like a seamless garment where there's no structure in the shoulders or sleeves to hold the weight of the garment together and give it some structure. Then a chainette yarn is a great choice because it's giving that the fibers the structure. The fourth mistake is not considering the yarn put up. And when I talk about put up, I mean the ratio of like the amount of yards in your skein of yarn compared to the actual weight of the skein. Let's say you have a skein of yarn, it's 100% wool, it's 200 yards in 100 grams. That's good, that's the base yarn from the pattern. So you choose a yarn, 100% wool, same gauge information, the yarn construction looks very similar, comes in a 50 gram ball, but it's 95 yards. That's pretty close to 100, so we'll round it up and say 100. So if we bought two of those balls, it would be 100 grams, and it would be about 200 yards, just 10 yards less. That's pretty close, that's pretty similar. I would say those yarns are comparable and could be interchanged. But let's say you chose a different yarn that isn't a 50 gram ball, but it has 150 yards in it. Well, we'd need two 50 gram balls to equal our 100 gram ball of the other yarn. And if we had that, that tells us it would be 300 yards of yarn. That's 100 yards difference for the same weight. Now that's a bigger difference and something is not quite right. If you've chosen a yarn that's in the same gauge, has the same fiber content, has the same construction, should be fairly similar at this stage. But where this really can change is if you've chosen a different type of fiber or a different type of yarn construction. If the pattern called for like a light woolen spun yarn, which is gonna have more yardage to the, the weight of the skein because it's so much more lightweight, if you choose like a, a three ply really tightly spun, that is more dense and you're gonna have less yardage in that ball of yarn compared to the woolen spun, which is going to have more. So this is something you have to consider. I'm not saying you can't choose one or the other, but it's going to affect your project if you choose a different yarn construction. Same with fibers, because in general, plant fibers are going to weigh more than wool and other animal fibers. So a skein of two yarns, one might be a wool, one might be a cotton. The cotton is probably going to have less yardage for that same 100 grams because it's heavier than the wool. I know this can feel a little confusing, but it does get easier the more you learn to substitute yarns. And as long as you consider these four things, then it becomes easier to make those substitutions. And you can even start to make bigger changes, like choosing a plant-based yarn instead of a wool, knowing their fiber properties, knowing how to choose a yarn that's going to be more lightweight so it mimics the properties of the wool. So let's get into some, some little yarn subplay. We're gonna look at some of these comments that were left and I'm gonna walk you through how I would substitute these yarns, just doing some Google searches and finding things online that you could find yourself. If you want, get your computer or your laptop or your phone out and do this along with me. Now the first thing I do when I'm looking at yarn substitution is I look up the, the yarn that's in that pattern first and I get all of this information that we've just gone over. I find out what weight category it fits in, the gauge information, the fiber content. I take a look at pictures of the yarn to see how it's spun and plied. Sometimes the manufacturer will tell you if it's worth or woolen spun. A lot of the time they won't, but you can sort of look at the yarn and tell if it's really fuzzy and light and airy looking. It might be a woolen spun or at least loosely plied. If it's really tightly spun and looks really durable and lots of plies, it's probably a worsted spun. So I asked for your comments. Thank you so much. You shared so many of them. We can't go through all of them today, but I picked a few that we can highlight, but the process would be the same for any yarn. We're gonna walk through exactly how I would use this process to substitute one yarn. If it's discontinued, if you just don't wanna buy it because it's so expensive, how you can go about finding an appropriate replacement for that yarn, or even how to choose one that isn't the same fiber. We're gonna get into that too. Now, if you wanna do this along with me, be sure to grab that checklist, and then you can practice doing these substitutions as well, using the checklist and writing in on the chart to see about the differences between the different types of yarns. So here's our first one, Lion Brand Shawl in a Ball. I still can't believe it's been discontinued. So the first thing I do is I look up the yarn itself. So the yarn is, the gauge is, it's a medium four worsted weight, 17 stitches, 25 rows. So they have specific stitches and rows. Then we look at the fiber content. This one is cotton and acrylic, and it's used for shawls, obviously. 
and because it's worsted weight we know it's going to knit up quickly for a shawl and cotton and acrylic so cotton usually has pretty good drape I'm not sure like there's different types of cotton that can affect it as well but we know for a shawl it's probably going for something that's nice and airy and drapey and then we can look at the construction of the yarn. If you look up close, it's a brushed acrylic, which mimics mohair, blended with that 100% cotton slub. So the, the cotton is used sort of as the core of the yarn. And then the acrylic is sort of brushed to give us that mohair effect and that sort of blended around that cotton strand. So this gives us, we can tell by looking at the yarn construction, that it's because of that brushed fiber, it's going to be light and airy, probably warm as well. And then last, I make note of the yarn put up. So it's 150 grams, 481 yards. What I do then is I take 481 and I divide it by 150. That tells me how many yards per gram. And then when I'm looking at other yarns, I can do the same with that yarn put up and then I can tell very quickly whether the yardage is very similar. So we have 3.2 yards per gram for this yarn. So the next step is to look at possible substitutes. Now you could go to your favorite place online that has lots of different yarns. Places like Knit Picks, Lovecrafts, Wool Warehouse, Webs, Yarn Canada. I'm in Canada. That's another good one that has lots of different yarns. I like to start with one of those places because they have lots of different manufacturers or lots of different yarn lines and I can start to do a search. I would search first for yarns within that same weight. So all of these websites will let you search by like worsted weight or fingering weight or whatever. It will give you that opportunity to search by that kind of weight measurement and that's the first thing I would do go to one of these websites or whichever place you like to shop and do a search by the so we can get to the gauge we want to just get a yarn first that's within the same weight category now this time I figured I'm gonna just go check Lion Brand itself first to see if they have any other comparable yarns and I did this search I searched for yarns that fell within the same gauge category and then because the construction of the yarn seemed to be an important thing maybe more than the fiber choice. I looked at the construction first. Now see, you can choose different things to look at depending on the yarn or the project that you're doing. And in this instance, because it's a brushed acrylic that's trying to mimic mohair, I'm not sure the fiber content is as important as like the yarn construction. You probably want a yarn that looks pretty similar, which has like that core or strand in the center with some sort of brushed fiber around it but that's still within the same weight or gauge category and then once I found some that looked to be like a similar construction then I looked at the fiber content now this is like I said interchangeable sometimes you're going to look at fiber content first and then yarn construction and then sometimes you might look at the construction first and then the fiber content like I did in this instance and this is what I found on Lion Brand website that I thought would be suitable replacement. There's Scarfy Light. It's a similar fiber content. It's acrylic, poly, nylon, and wool. So wool instead of cotton in there, but it's still acrylic. The yarn construction is a bit different. It's not like that, that uh, strand of cotton and then a brushed acrylic around it. But it is loosely plied and still has a fuzzy quality about it, so it's still going to be lightweight and warm like the other yarn. The put up is almost the same. This one comes in 100 grams instead of 150, but the gram to yardage ratio is pretty similar. Then after that, I just did a simple Google search because I wasn't sure where I would find a brushed acrylic that was very similar to this shawl in a ball. But I did find one on Hobby called Fluffy Day. This one is 100% acrylic. The weight and the gauge information is very similar. The yarn construction, again, is not the same, but it is lightly plied and brushed so it still has that lightweight feel and that fuzzy look to it. And this one is 100 grams, but the ratio of grams to yards is very similar as well. So that would be how I would substitute. I would probably choose one of those. I know that it's not an exact substitute because it doesn't have that same like cotton core with brushed acrylic on the outside, but you should still get this a similar effect because they're lightly spun or loosely spun They'll still be warm and have the, the probably the drape or the fuzziness that you're looking for. See, that's also something to consider is like, what are you looking for in your finished project? And can you get that with a different yarn? Then the next one was Novita Nale and Novita Seven Brothers. So we're just going to look up the first one. This one, Novita Nale, is a DK or a light three is the, the CYC designation. And 22 stitches and 32 rows. 
and the fiber content, 75% wool, 25% polyamide. It says mach machine washable, so I'm assuming it's a super wash yarn. Then when I look at patterns on the website itself for this yarn, it, it uses it for color work. So I'm and looking at the yarn, it looks like it has like a slightly fuzzy halo. So it's going to work well for color work where you want sort of those colors to blend together. Instead of like another perhaps sock yarn that's going to be not so fuzzy and has more stitch definition to it. This one's on the fuzzy side. It is applied yarn though. And the put up is 284 yards and 100 grams. So that's 2.84 yards per gram. So that's the information about that yarn. So then we can go to all of our sources where we like to shop. First thing we'd do is would look for that weight category and fiber content. This time we are looking for a super wash. Then I looked at the yarn construction itself. So we're looking for applied yarn, but this one does have sort of a fuzzy appearance. So I wanna find one that might be a little fuzzy too. So this time I searched Lovecrafts to see what they had and I found Willow and Lark Heather Solids. Now this one's a blend of wool and acrylic. It's applied yarn with about the same yardage to grams ratio. This one comes in 50 gram skeins though. Then I also found Rowan Moordale. So this one is a blend of wool and alpaca. So different fiber contents here. But this one is also applied but it's soft and fuzzy and would be good for color work and it has that drape and softness too because of the alpaca and the put up is also the same. So you can see there's different fiber contents but they're still basically mostly wool. One is acrylic, one has alpaca. So that can affect the yarn and um, the fuzziness of it or the color or all of those things but you don't have to have the exact fiber content. Still the, the put up is about the same so you could substitute those yarns. Again depending on what you're looking for in your final project. Our next one's from Candel Knitting for All of Pure Silk. Now this one was a toughie so I went to the website first. So the gauge on this is a super fine one. It's fingering weight 28 stitches 38 rows and 4 inches. It's 100% silk but the this is a, there's different types of silk. When you think of like a mulberry silk, that's made with the cocoons before the moths can escape, like they're boiled and unraveled and it kills the moths, obviously. And that's like the most expensive or highly prized type because it's all these long unbroken strands. On the other hand, this type of wool or fiber or silk, I should say, is borette silk. Now this is collected after the moths have broken out of their cocoon and then it's spun. So it's not as smooth as mulberry silk because that's spun from the unbroken cocoons, obviously. And if you look at the yarn in the picture, you can see it doesn't, it's, it still has like that shiny luster of a silk, but it's not, it doesn't have like the smooth, smooth texture of a silk. It looks like it has a little more, I don't know, texture to it, like a linen almost. So it is applied yarn and the put up is 273 yards and 50 grams. So we're looking at 5.46 yards per gram, which is quite a lot. So this might be that. So the more yards in a gram means the more lightweight that yarn is. The fewer yards in a gram means that that yarn is more dense and heavier. So that was one of the issues I had because it's hard to find this specific type of silk. There's lots of silk out there, but not all of them are this borette silk. You'll find a lot of mulberry silk, which is a very high shine like this one, but it's smoother. And the weight put up is different as well. So I went to Lovecrafts again and did a search for the weight category and the fiber content because I, with a silk yarn, you want to look for something that is very similar in fiber content or is going to give you the same properties, most likely. And I did find Malabrigo Mora, which is 100% silk, but it's mulberry silk. So it's not quite the same, and it also has slightly less yardage in the put-up than this one does. So it means that this silk is heavier, so less yardage in this one. The other one I saw on there is BC Garn Soft Silk. It's actually the same type of silk but it's more of a slubby yarn. If I look at the two pictures, I can see that this one has more texture in it. And the put up ratio is different too. There's much less yardage per weight. So this one is a denser yarn. It's not as lightweight. So it's not an exact match and the garment would be heavier if you chose this yarn. So I kept looking because I wanted to find something comparable. I checked Knit Picks, I checked Wool Warehouse, and I couldn't find anything that was very similar to, especially the put up of this yarn because silk is heavier. This one's fairly lightweight. So I was looking for a lightweight yarn that was still mostly silk, couldn't find anything. So then I thought, let's look at maybe a different fiber that would give us something similar. Then I thought of Flax and Silk Fine from Sweet Georgia. 
Now, this is a different fiber content because it's a linen and silk. So it's still going to have sort of, when I looked at the original yarn, it looks very similar to some linens I've seen. I've never used this yarn in person, so I can't really tell. I can only go by the pictures, but I have used the flax and silk fine. And it does have sort of that linen feel to it, along with the silk, which gives it that beautiful shine. So it's a different fiber, but it's the same weight category. And the put up it also has slightly less yardage, so that means this yarn is slightly heavier. But I think it could be a good substitute, even if you're okay with switching and not using 100% silk. So this one was a tough one because I couldn't find one that was like an exact match. But there are some comparables. You could use other silks, or you could use something like a linen or a linen silk blend. Again, it would depend on what you're looking on in the fiber or in your project itself, like what's most important, that high sheen of the silk, or do you want the drape of the fiber, then you can get that from other fibers. So there, I mean, there's still, so you can see that this is not a hard science, like you have to make a judgment call about which yarn you could substitute. Then Cyclone Wolf mentions Sandness Garn Double Sunday. So I looked up the yarn. Now this one is a worsted medium four weight, 20 stitches and four inches, 100% merino wool, plied yarn with a good tight twist, so it's great for texture and stitch definition. The yarn put up is 118 yards and 50 grams, which is 2.36 yards per gram. So I went to Lovecrafts again, or if you go to any of these places, Webb's uh, Wool Warehouse, and just do a search by the weight category and the fiber content. There are lots of wool yarns out there. And I was also looking at the yarn construction. So I want to look for a merino that has a good tight twist and not fuzzy to keep it as similar as possible to this original yarn. Now, when I searched on Lovecrafts, I found a lot of choices just scrolling right through. The Malibri Gorios, the Milamia Naturally Soft Erin, the Lana Grassa Cool Bit Wool Big, Debbie Bliss Rialto Erin. So you could look at each of those and then you would do the same thing, like make sure the put up is the same and look at the ply and the twist of the yarn to make sure that it is similar to the ply and the twist of your base yarn. Then Deanna Rose says Malabrigo washed it, her favorite but expensive. So I looked up that yarn. It's also medium four worsted, 20 stitches to four inches. This time it's 100% super wash merino. And then this one is a single ply. And the yarn put up is 210 yards and 100 grams, so 2.1 yards per gram. So it's the same weight category as the previous yarn, but the construction is different and it's a superwash yarn. Now this one was a bit tougher because it's harder to find a single ply like that. So when I was looking at Lovecrafts again, scrolling through, the only other one I saw was the Malabrigo yarn. So I reset the search filter to look at all of the wools, not just Superwash. And I did find one, Valley Yarns Berkshire. Looks like it could be a good substitute, as long as you're fine with using a non-Superwash yarn. The fiber content is 85% wool, 15% alpaca. Same weight category, gauge is a bit different, but ball band gauges are just estimations. You don't have to knit to the same gauge as the ball band. And then the yarn put up is fairly close as well. So if I'd wanted to keep looking, I could search those other places like Wool Warehouse or Knit Picks or Webs or wherever you like to shop. So I think you're getting the idea of how you would do that. If you're gonna stick to a similar fiber or maybe combine it with another fiber. But what if you want to change the fiber content? Now when it comes to substitution, this comment says, any yarn with animal origins, as I'm highly allergic to those, I mostly use cotton whenever I can, but many times have to use the dreaded acrylics. Now I'm not sure why you dread acrylics. They have their place, and if you're allergic to animal yarns, then I would assume that it has a place there. So, um, but when it comes to substituting fiber families, you have to look at each individual project. What is it about that project? What properties are you looking at in that project? Are you looking at stitch definition, durability, drape, softness, all of those things? What's important there? And then that can influence what fibers you want to choose. Now acrylic, and I'm not talking about like the novelty acrylics, but a good basic acrylic is meant to mimic wool. So that is a good substitute. It's meant to be as elastic and lightweight as wool. So in general, your acrylics are going to be able to replace wool. Now it's harder to replace a pattern with wool with a plant fiber because those just, the general categories, they're just very different. And plants just are not as elastic or, and they're heavier. So it's harder to make an adjustment if the original yarn you or the original pattern used wool but it's not impossible you can look at the structure of the garment if it has seams 
then it's got some structure that will help support that the yarn that you're using. If it's seamless, go for something where a chainette construction that will give you some structure for that plant fiber. It's not impossible, but you just have to be considered, uh, consider how, why or, why or how you're replacing those fibers. Then the next comment, anything held double with mohair? I don't like mohair. We're going to address that one in a second. Then the second half, is there an alternative to wool for color work as in Fair Isle does acrylic work? Now, wool is ideal for color work because you're holding, you've got lots of different strands of yarn going on because you've got the colors and the, the scales on the yarn, usually the yarn that's appropriate for color work will sort of stick together and give you, like all the stitches will sort of blend if you're going for that kind of look. You can also use a yarn that has better stitch definition if you're thinking of like Scandinavian color work where it's like done in two colors, very high contrast. You might actually want to see the stitches stand out, so you're going to choose a different type of wool for that. In that instance, an acrylic works really well because you want that stitch definition and the, the noticeable difference between the stitches. If you want to try color work more like the Fair Isle where it's really sort of blended and muted, look for an acrylic that's more fuzzy or brushed. And of course, you're gonna to wanna to swatch to see how it's going to work. I can't say all acrylics are going to work for color work. Depends on the type of color work and it depends on how, how much stitch definition you want or how fuzzy you want it to be. You wanna choose a yarn that will give you that sort of property and acrylics can do that. So back to that mohair question along with this one, are there any substitutes for mohair type yarns that give somewhat the same effect? I live in Texas and mohair is too hot. Well, all of the brushed yarns, even the brushed acrylic that we talked about at the beginning, the whole point of these like brushed fibers is to trap air, make things more warm, and to give it that fuzzy soft halo. So none of them are going to be appropriate for Texas if it's hot. You're not gonna get a fuzzy halo because or, I mean, you can use it, but it's going to be hot because the whole point of that fuzzy halo is to trap the warmth in your garment. So it doesn't add extra bulk to your garment, but it's going to make it very warm. There, there isn't a replacement for that. They're all sort of like interchangeable. One brushed yarn can, I mean, as long as it fits the same, those four areas that we've talked about can be used, held together, especially with another yarn, to give it that quality that you're looking for in the garment. If you don't want the fuzziness, then just don't use that fuzzy yarn. And that brings us to the next one about holding two strands together. Substituting lace weight mohair and fingering DK Aran weight held together. So any sort of combinations where you're holding two yarns together. So this is a very popular thing because a lot of sweater patterns seem to do this where you're holding like that fuzzy mohair with another strand of yarn. So we're gonna break this into two parts. First is you want to knit with two strands. So what you're gonna do is work through these four steps with both of those yarns. If you're substituting both, work through the four steps that we just outlined here, looking for an appropriate substitute. Then you're gonna to have to buy a skein of each and swatch them to see how they look held together. Nothing around that, like you just have to swatch to find out how it's going to look. So what if you don't wanna hold two strands together and you just wanna knit with one strand? First of all, look at the pattern, it should tell you the gauge information saying like holding these two strands together will give you a bulky weight or a DK weight. It should give you the gauge information. So then you can look, you're going to start your search with that gauge information instead of the yarn that's used in the pattern. You want to start with the yarn that has the same gauge because you're not holding two yarns double. And then you can still look for the same fiber types. You could even look for a brushed yarn to still get sort of that fuzzy look or a woolen spun or something that's just not as tightly plied to still give you the fuzziness without having to hold two strands together. Now really the best way to know if one yarn is going to work as a substitute for another is to swatch and test. Make a swatch, see how that fabric acts. It does it provide the properties that you want in your finished garment. That's really the best way to find out. But of course, we wanna like at least narrow it down to see which yarns would be the best choice. So if you follow these four steps, then that should get you well on your way to choosing the right yarn for your next project. Now choosing the right yarn is just the first step. Once you've done that, you need to swatch and take some gauge measurements. And there are some best practices about that too. So your swatch doesn't lie to you and it tells you the truth. And I go over that in this video right here. So click right there and I'll see you in the next video.